one of the people who, unlike Ray Dalio, uh, really, really understands Bitcoin and has become a massive proponent since last time we talked uh, is Michael Saylor. Uh, you recently produced an entire series uh, called the Saylor Series, um, where you just talked with him. And so maybe talk through a little bit uh, in terms of your understanding of his worldview uh, and then what you took away from uh, the recording of that series. Yeah, so another one of these just out of the blue events was actually Sailor and MicroStrategy. Um, you know, he was in a unique position in that his company was sitting on a lot of cash. Um, Sailor, for the audience that may not know, is the CEO of MicroStrategy. They're a NASDAQ listed business intelligence firm. Um, they had been running a pretty conservative ship uh, financially, at least for the past decade, they're sitting on a, a, a nice treasury of cash, about $500 million. And in the wake of COVID, uh, you know, as, as Michael's been making his media rounds, he just had to figure out what to do with this melting ice cube. And they evaluated all their, their alternatives and ultimately decided on Bitcoin. So it was interesting. I think this was August, maybe when he announced originally. And I just woke up one day, saw this announcement. I'm like, what is this? this? This is crazy. Some big corporation has bought a, a ton of Bitcoin. And then in my, I've got a Twitter DM from him and he's just sending me a, a link to the article. And so we start having a conversation and, you know, it turns out he had been following a lot of the, the maximalists and, you know, your show and other people's writings for a long time or, you know, relatively long time, a few months. And he, the interesting, interesting thing about that for me was that this guy went from essentially, you know, he had disclaimed Bitcoin back in 2013. I don't think he thought a lot about it between 13 and 2020, to my knowledge. Then all of a sudden he has this COVID event where he has to reevaluate his liquidity profile and how he's going to maintain shareholder value um, in the treasury. So from March 2020 to August, so we're talking about a course of five months, he basically fully accelerated down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, right? He went through all the, all the content we produced, all the writing, he knew it all. Um, and so the amazing thing about that to me was, that, and I, I thought this before, that the thesis of Bitcoin, although it's extremely complicated, it's very multidisciplinary, you have to understand things from many different angles to really to grok Bitcoin or to understand it. The general value proposition is not that complicated once you get it, right? It's just money that has a fixed supply. So you can't, it's money that can't be stolen, value that can't be stolen through inflation, deauthorization, confiscation, all of these things. And I had this thesis that people would wake up to this relatively simple, once this idea got out and it, it sort of shook off the FUD that, that still plagues it a little bit, that people would um, take this idea up very quickly because it's just money that can't be reproduced in a world where money is being infinitely reproduced by the central bank. And I thought he, you know, Sailor's acceleration in the rabbit hole was one great example of that. He, he just, he <laughs> went zero to hero, so to speak, in just the course of a few months. So in our conversations, I was talking to him and I said, you know, I had this idea for a show. I didn't even know what it would be at this point, podcast, YouTube channel, whatever. I just said, I wanted to sit down with the best thinkers in the Bitcoin space, but also in, in the macroeconomic world. So it's not just a Bitcoin focused podcast uh, and talk to them in a long form discussion. So I would sit down and talk to you as long as it took. We could talk for 50 hours if you wanted. And the, the idea was to get to the first principles of your worldview. So basically externalizing the mind of these amazing thinkers and show the world how they think, how they build their worldview. And my thesis behind this was that in a lot of this coming from the book, The Sovereign Individual, which we talked about last time too, in the 1500s, or I guess it was around 1490 when Gutenberg invented the printing press, we collapsed the cost of information access. So all of a sudden we went from like 10 million books produced in the prior 500 years, there were 10 million books produced in a decade once the printing press was made available. And the consequence of this was a, there was a great many more thinkers emerging in the world, a great uh, much more variety of thought emerging in the world. And a lot of this 
uh, new critical thinking was actually heretical to the institution of the day, which was the church. So the printing press sort of led to the downfall of the church as the dominant institution in the world. But the thought there was that it's the, when we decrease the cost of accessing information, we actually increase general critical thinking or general intelligence, right? People can access information more freely. Uh, ideas are much more free flowing. So I thought that here in the digital age, maybe we're seeing something similar. We've once again collapsed the cost of information. You know, we have the, the library of the world, so to speak, at our fingertips through a smartphone or a laptop, that maybe this would be a similar type event to the Gutenberg printing press. And we're actually gonna increase critical thinking in the world um, and increase kind of general intelligence. So what I wanted to bring into this new paradigm was long form discussions that would, that would almost be like the intellectual Olympics in a way. Like you sit down and you see someone that's got, you know, a long track record of experience, um, you know, a, clearly a brilliant guy. He wrote a book in 2010 called The Mobile Wave that basically said, go out and buy Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. They're going to dominate the world. Clearly, that thesis played out perfectly over the past decade. Um, and just, you know, help spread, I, I guess, the information that these people have obtained, uh, that, they've, that they've won, basically, through hard won through experience um, throughout their careers, and, and share that with the world and see if people um, would, would have an affinity for it. And it turns out, I think the thesis is right so far. I'm getting feedback on the Sailor series specifically that it's some of the best content people have ever seen. Because this guy, to give you a little idea, we really tried to build his entire worldview from first principles. So we started in the Stone Age. We're talking about Stone Age technologies like fire, hydraulics, which are you know using water to overcome gravity, missiles, and building this view of how mankind is the animal that channels energy across time and space toward the achievement of aims. That's what distinguishes us from every other animal is that we can plan, we can build these intellectual structures. We then go out and harness energy to, to energize those structures and we create things in the world. That's what civilization is. And just brick by brick, building this intellectual edifice that took us from the stone age into the industrial age, into the digital age, frankly, and then uh, evaluating Bitcoin through that long scope of how this impacts everything going forward, how it totally changes the game. And Sailor is just a master speaker. Um, he drops in so many wonderful analogies comparing Bitcoin to the discovery of steel, or Bitcoin to the discovery of antiseptics, right? Um, making the point that, you know, fiat currency is like toxic money, actually. It's, it infects our socioeconomic structures. And now we have a money that, that's basically free of, of unpredictability. And now that's just a total game changer. So we recorded um, two sessions initially, about five hours each. That came out to about nine episodes. We're scheduled to do at least one more session. That could be between another one and three episodes. Uh, going forward, I'm gonna sit down with other prolific thinkers in the space. Jeff Booth is next. Uh, we're already working on that conversation framework. Uh, just got an all-star cast lined up. And for me, this is amazing because this is something I would be doing no matter what. Uh, it really is a passion project. It it's deeply satisfies my own intellectual curiosity as I'm trying to write and think about these things uh, in new and varied perspectives. Like to get inside someone's mind to this extent changes me. Like I'm, I now think differently as a result of interacting with Sailor uh, throughout this series. And um, yeah, I'm just super excited about it. I think um, we can keep, you know, I think people really like the first one and I'm hoping they're going to like uh, the ones to come here. So. Absolutely. 